Are you at your point where you think you've hit your bottom or maybe that there's just no way you're ever going to feel like things can change? I was like that. I really was. And I want you to know, my name is Bromo, by the way. I want you to know that there is a way out. Please join us for my podcasts. All right, it's me again. This is my 32nd podcast already since I read the uh, Rebegan the uh, There Is a Way Out. My name is Bromo. I am an alcoholic. My sobriety date is 2-1709. It is the 26th of April. It is about uh, almost 3 o'clock. It's been raining all day here in Bismarck, which I love the rain, by the way, but a lot of people don't. <laughs> That's okay. First of all, I'm not an expert. Uh, I don't have any certification. I do this for many reasons. One in particular, when I'm interviewing somebody, when I have them on the phone, when I have them sharing on my podcast, a great deal of time, they I've never met them. And I'm listening to their story for the first time. And for me, everybody's share means a lot. I learn from everyone. And today I have a gentleman uh, on with me right now named Bill Schneider. You there, buddy? Yes, sir. Bill, how are you today? You're in Bismarck, aren't you? Yes, sir. Doing pretty good. How are you? I'm well. You know what it's like. I said this a couple of weeks ago. When the temperatures finally go up out here in Bismarck, people start coming out of their houses in shorts and bikes. And it's almost like a parade, isn't it? Because the weather is changing. Isn't that right? Oh, yeah. It hits that 35, 40 degree mark. You start seeing motorcycles out and everybody thinks it's summer. How old are you, Bill? I'm 42 years old. Once again, Bill and I have never met. We just talked together for the first time today. I know just a tad bit about Bill, but that doesn't matter. And and this is why, once again, this is why I have this podcast. This is why I love it so much when people tell me that they enjoy afterwards sharing their story. I, I do know this, that Bill has no problem sharing his story because he just did that earlier today, didn't you, Bill? Yes, sir. So you got no problem talking to people and telling people, your life story and how, first of all, uh, how long have you been sober? What's your sobriety date? Uh, December 27th. Um, so I got two and a half years. It'll be three this December 27th. Congratulations. You know how that goes. You know, you know, the wonderment of staying sober and you also know, and you've seen it (laughs) at meetings. You've seen people take tokens. You've seen that, that gleam in their eyes when they talk about how they got sober. And this is one of the reasons why you and I are in this program uh, because of recovery. What was your drug of choice? Uh, drinking or you, if you feel comfortable? All of them. Share, all of them. Okay. So yeah, you, you, I, drugs and, I and alcohol? Got, yeah. So I started out primarily like um, with alcohol when I was probably 10. And then I got into the marijuana at a, probably the age of, uh, let's see here, probably 12. Let me ask you a couple quick, a quick, le, quick let me uh, clarify a couple things here. And for those of you who have listened to my podcast before, I sure appreciate it. They also know that I interrupt a lot. And I don't mean to do that to be an a-hole. I interrupt sometimes, Bill, because I want to get right to the question that I have. So uh, I guess for now I'm apologizing for any interrupting that I'm doing. Does that make any sense? Totally fine by me. Okay, so you started when you were ten. Did your what kind of family environment did you have? Um, I had a pretty good uh, family environment. Uh, my parents were married when I started, and they got divorced around um, junior high. Okay. And did you stay with your mom? Did you go live with your dad? What did you do? Um, I stayed with my dad for a little bit, and then I ended up living on my own Yeah, uh, in high school. When you lived with your dad, was it more of a feeling like, hey, maybe, I have, maybe I'll have a little more freedom with my dad than my mom? Maybe uh, you know he'll give me a couple more lengths of rope, so to speak, so I can go out and do stuff with my friends rather than, you know, sometimes moms will be a little bit more strict. Was that about it? Because when I was 12, my parents got divorced, and I had to make a decision uh, a little later on after that who to live with. So, yeah, um, the way it kind of turned out is um, I lived with my dad um, just because uh, 
it was uh, probably more convenient. Yeah. Um, he was he would probably been the more strict one. I've always been with mama's little boy. Sure. Did you have any brothers or sisters? I have two sisters. Yes. Yeah. Are you the oldest one? Are you mid, or what? I'm the I'm the baby boy. I'm the youngest. Okay, I get that. Okay, so you started drinking when you were ten. Was it just kind of hanging out and uh, having some drinks with some friends, or did you did your parents introduce booze to you? Did they? Because some parents don't no. mind if you have a beer or two, whatever age you are, you know. No. Um, so my first drinking experience, I pretty much. Um, I don't know what I was thinking. I've kind of been a knucklehead my whole life. Yeah. So I just kind of went to the fridge. I grabbed the, my dad's, um, I think there was maybe four left of his six pack of Miller Pounders. And uh, I grabbed those and a carton of eggs. I jumped on my pedal bike. A couple of my friends, didn't, they didn't even want to drink. I just slammed them beers and then um, threw them in the neighbor's backyard. And then I jumped on my pedal bike and went and egged the school and egged some girl's house that made fun of me. Okay. First of all, you and I both know. That if your dad, is your dad still around? Yeah, he is, yep. Is he one of us? Is he in the program? Is he an alcoholic? No, is he, he a dr- drug addict? No? No. So he, at that point, probably wouldn't know if you took two beers out of his four left. Because, damn it, man, I sure would know. I would know if you <laughs> took, I, wouldn't you? Aren't you laughing because you know that? If you had four left? And someone swiped one of your beers, you would know, wouldn't you? Man, I sure would. Oh, well, I took all, I took whatever was left of the six pack and slammed them all. Yeah, right. And, and they've always had kind of liquor in the house and yep. stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd, I'd do the old trick of, um, you know, I was a beginner, so I, yeah. I'd, I'd take out the whiskey bottles, pour some out, or, you know, for myself, and then I'd fill it up, and then it would fog up from the water. So I had a learning curve there. Why do you think you drank? At that age, did you want to be tough? Did you just think it was, I mean, um, did you like it? Did you like the taste? Did you like the effect? So, so I, I think um, uh, I've always um, kind of drank because, um, or did drugs at that age. I was just experimenting. Uh, my dad had a heavy haul company, so he was gone working a lot. My mom was working a lot. I think it was just mainly boredom. Right. Summer boredom, so right? Not, you're on summer school. You're you're not in summer school. You're 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 on summer vacation, and you're looking for something to just do, right? Right, right. And your friends probably you had a, probably a small group of friends, big group. Um. Uh, so yeah, I had a pretty big group of friends. Um. I was always kind of uh, everybody kind of knew me, but I was kind of a spoiled rotten kid. So yeah. Uh, um. I kind of kind of became a everybody liked me but i was a social outcast nobody wanted to really hang out with me yeah so i just kind of um did things to try to fit in you know the acting out for attention um being the class clown that sort of thing did you do well in school not at all yeah i hated school did you like school i hated it not at all yeah my teachers were all boring uh i only had one teacher that i still remember by to this day, who instilled me in, he gave me some uh, encouragement to write an essay about something that I enjoyed, which I think was what teachers should do. And every other teacher from every other subject was sheer boring. So I ditched a lot, but I ditched and watched TV. When you, when you were not uh, loving school, did you start drinking more or what'd you wind up doing? Well, so um, after I egged um, the the school and yeah. the principal's car and that girl's, uh, that girl's house and stuff, I got charged with vandalism. And then um, my family, you know, we're probably your middle class family. Yeah. Um, they sent me to um, St. Anne's um, school. Okay. And then um, that's kind of where I got into um, smoking weed. Tell us what that sc- what was the school called they sent you to? Uh, St. Anne's. What is that? Oh, it's just a private school. Okay. Catholic school here, here in Bismarck. It's called what again? I couldn't. St. Anne's. St. Anne's. Is that what you said? Yep. Okay. Our phone system blows sometimes, but St. Anne's, it's a private school. Is it more of a uh, rigid, strict school where they keep an eye on you? 
yeah, so uh, not not really so much like that. And it was a good school. It's not like I brought the drugs to the school. The school I didn't find the drugs at the school, but yeah, um, it just was the fact of being a kind of um, uncomfortable in a group of my peers, maybe not being socially accepted by them. Yeah. So okay. then the first ch- chance I got, I started smoking pot and and kind of. Um, ran into a situation where I, I found a good um, amount of weed mm-hmm. and I started selling it at the school to kind of get accepted by everybody there. Did you find a lot of people that would buy stuff off you? Uh, yeah. Well, at school, like, kind of um, kind of just introduced uh, a lot of people to, to weed. Oh, did you, you know, really? Kind of, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, that's uh, interesting because I never saw it when I was in school because I didn't hang around hardly anybody. I just had a few people that I ditched and watched I Love Lucy with and ate roll tacos. <laughs> what kind of rebel kid was I back then? But, you know, there's different groups. So you so you were able to sell and and tell people about it, and they went and tried it, and they loved it, right? And they gave you money for it, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you look at that. So <laughs> what age were you when you began to think, well, this is fun. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll uh, experiment on something else, or maybe I'll start drinking more. Were you still drinking at this point? Um, you know, just what I could um, sneak from the the folks. Yeah, right. But I kind of kind of got into the weed thing, and then um, started selling it. Okay. And, and probably like the seventh, eighth grade. Yeah. Uh, I was selling quite a bit, and then um, then um, I would say. And in ninth grade is kind of when things started to change. Um, that's about when my parents got divorced. Yeah. Um, and then, and then, um, uh, things living with my dad didn't go well. I'm kind of bullheaded. He's bullheaded. Yeah. And, um, then I kind of, um, kind of started getting into heavier drinking yeah. through high school and then started with the, the, um, doing the harder drugs. What kind of harder drugs? So, um, I started with, uh, meth yeah. and then, um, got in the, um, started selling cocaine. Wow. Okay. You were selling it, huh? Yeah. If, when I was in, I would say my soph- sophomore year, um, is when the change happened mm-hmm. to, uh, um, and then I got indicted by the feds my senior, uh, when I graduated my senior year. Well, right before that, were you ever scared that you were going to get caught when you were starting to sell cocaine and things like that? No. No. No fear, right? Right. Well, I don't know if it's no fear, not many brain cells. Okay. Well, yeah, right. Okay, so tell us if that was like you got indicted, right? Yeah, so my dad knew there was a problem. My parents knew that I had an issue. Um so I um, I was I was selling drugs. I got I graduated high school. Okay. And my dad had me lined up to um, uh, be shipped out of out of town because he was just trying to keep me out of trouble. Right. So they sent me down custom harvesting um, with uh, a group of people, um, and then they um, we went we we're down there uh, that started out in Texas. And they, uh, the day I graduated, because it was kind of iffy if I was going to even graduate, and I missed so much school. I was living on my own, and they just had enough of it. And they're like, all right, they had this lined up, and um, they sent me down there. What? Down what, to uh, this Texas. Is, and to what was this called? Way up. This, what was this called? Um, cu- um, it was custom combining. Custom combining. And what is, what is that? What is that? That's a... Uh, uh, a place, a uh, uh, placement for uh, people who are in trouble, no. or just what? Oh, there's plenty of trouble. But what they do is, um, come harvest season, okay. You know, you um, they um, big farmers will just pay people to come and combine their 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 um, crop for them. Oh, I got and it. it. You know, I was thinking the other thing, Bill. I thought it was so, like some 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 sort of home for oh. for bad people or <laughs> for people. For people that uh, weren't fitting in, when you said, of course, it was a farming thing, right? Yeah. Okay. That makes and sense. And instead of, instead of changing when I went down there, it turned, I turned it into a big party in, in every state I was in. 
So everywhere you and went, everywhere you went, you expressed yourself, so to speak, right? Well, it just kind of, um, <laughs> from a, a young age, it just kind of showed me wherever you go, there you are. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, we got back up here, you know, um, at the towards the end of the summer. You know, you work your way up. In about, you know, towards August, we we were back in North Dakota. Yeah. And um, I uh, just jumped right back into the drugs, you know, again. Yeah. And um, then what kind of happened was um, when I was do- messing with the mess, I didn't drink. So when I was um, I was got back to doing mess again, I quit drinking, and then that's when um, that's when the problems really started happening. Uh, I had a brand new car, and um, I don't. It was I was heading over from uh, Bismarck to Mandan, or Mandan to Bismarck. I'm sorry. Right. And there's a bar bar called the Broken Ore. Yep. Uh, off off the south side of the interstate, and um, I went and took out that guardrail. I, was, I blacked out, yeah. spun the car around, and I remember it used to have cables, and the cable came through the windshield and stopped. Like I don't, the only thing I remember is it stopped like a couple inches from my face. Jeez. So, kind of was on, went on the run from that DUI type thing. Yeah. And um, that's when I did. Um, I met somebody, and um, things that we had. Um, a drug dealer that didn't go well, and I ended up robbing um, a drug dealer. And um, I was sitting in county jail, you know, kind of being a, a smart aleck to law enforcement. Right. And um, that's when um, I was sitting in county jail. My dad came to visit me, and he was like, I'm not bailing you out this time. And I was like, I didn't even ask you to come see me. Yeah. Uh, he left, and then... Um, they were like, Schneider, pack up your stuff. Uh, packed up, I packed up my stuff, and that's when they came with a federal indictment. And it wasn't anybody I knew that was sitting there to pick me up. It was the U.S. Marshals. Now, what does that and mean? Does that they... mean you're going to prison? Oh, yeah. Okay, let me ask you this. This is the intriguing part for me. When they came and got you, did you know how long you were going to be in prison? No. Okay. How old were you? Uh... 18. You had been in jail before, but not prison, right? Um, no, this would have been my first time in jail. Oh, in jail, jail. Okay. So you hadn't done any yeah. of that anyway. So let's bypass jail. Let's take you to prison, right? Okay. No, isn't that right? Is that what happened? No, no you, you had to go to jail until you, um, um, until you get sentenced to prison. Okay, so you were so, in jail for a little bit, and then you got sentenced to prison. They came and got you, right? Right. So I was in jail on that strong arm robbery with the drug dealer. Yeah. And then, um, and then while I was sitting in jail, county jail for that, the federal government, the feds came because that was a state case, and then the feds came and indicted me for um, selling uh, drugs. All right, you'll have so to then, apologize. They, You're gonna have. To, I'm gonna have to apologize okay. for a couple things. First of all, how naive I am. Tell everybody what the difference is between jail and prison. I'd like to know. Well, so in the United States, you're innocent until you're proven guilty. Sure. Is what they say. So you sit and you're, if you, get, if you um, get arrested and they put you in jail, you normally sit there until you go through your court process. Okay. And then, they, and then they'll come back around and um, pick, after you get sentenced, after, you know, like, if you ever gotten a DUI yeah. or something like that, and then, you know, you go to jail on a serious crime, they normally take you to jail and someone's either got to post your bond to get out yeah. or you just kind of sit there until your case goes in front of the judge for sentencing. Right. And then they'll sentence you to prison. Okay. So, t- but tell everybody mentally and physically, what's the difference between jail and prison? Is prison that much more harsh? More dangerous, um, would you say? I probably up here in North Dakota, but other states have some pretty dangerous county jails. You know, your bigger cities, your metro areas, and then um, jail is pretty much. Um, I don't know. Prison is more like jail is just kind of like 
uh, you sit, you're sitting in a cell block all day playing checkers or whatever, whatever you do yeah. and, um, cards or whatever. And then when you get to prison, it's more like the, um, some of them are, they're all different, you know, depending on what level you're at, yeah. but some of them you have to go to work every day, you know, and, and some of them, they're just all different. And you're young still and mentally being in a jail or in a prison cell. I don't know if you know this, but lately I've been watching this show on Netflix I say that right, flex, flicks. And uh, they were showing some people in prison, 23-1. And I said to myself, what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you what 23-1 mean, means. You know what that means. That means 23 hours in your cell, one hour out. How in the hell, Bill, can you be in that environment without going crazy? What did you do? Did you read a lot? What do you do mentally for that when you're in prison behind bars and you cannot go anywhere? How do you do that? Well, you, you, you just figure it out. You know, like the, the prison I went to um, was um, I, I started out in the feds at a medium low because it was my first offense. And then I got, you know, at that prison, you weren't on lockdown 23 hours. Yeah, you you know um, those are your like more higher security prisons. Sure. And um, so what I I um, got in a, a lot of trouble at that first prison. Right. For um, fighting, and then um, I got I went to the um, the shoe department, uh, which is the the uh, solitary confinement, or um, they call it the hole. Yeah. And then that that's when I was locked. I was, so I was getting shipped. Yeah, and they did an investigation under it because um, they had these other char- um, inside charges against me yeah. for starting this fight, and then um, so I actually sat in the hole for like eight, eight months, and that was that's enough to drive. Um, Good dr- lord! Hey. Yeah. So it, well, in that time, I, I just did a lot of reading and um, kind of just kind of do a little workout yep. and just try to pass the day. Uh, oh, yeah. Do you come across any booze or uh, drugs in in prison or jail? You know, you see some oh, of those yeah. movies where you see some of those movies where those those people are able to pass them around. They get them under tow somewhere, and they say that sometimes it's very easy access to get that. Is that true? Yeah. Wow. Yep. Isn't that? Crazy? I mean, I don't know how how um, it is out here, but. The federal system had a whole big problem with God. getting drugs in. You know, I've said this on my pod, I've said this on my podcast before, Bill, and I'll tell you again. For those of you who heard it a million times, when I was at uh, one of my recovery homes way out in the desert, they brought some guys in from jail who were allowed to to do this program, and they were gladly. Uh, in the program so they can get out of jail and they were living here in this recovery home and one of them was telling me about jail and prison or whatever and I said to him just like I asked you I said to him is there booze or drugs and he goes oh yeah I used to get drunk all the time and this tells you what an alcoholic I am Bill I said to him that doesn't sound too shabby man sitting in your cell bombed to hell drunk as hell he goes what are you talking about and then I thought about it later that's a pretty stupid thing to say, but at that point, I thought that doesn't sound too shabby. Getting drunk and hanging out in your cell all day—that's pretty pathetic, isn't it, Bill? Um. Well, I used to do it, so. Um, no, I, I know, yeah, but it is. That's what we do, so, right? That's what we did. So I ended up getting transferred from there. From was I was in, started out back then. Wasika was a. Male federal holding, uh, federal um, SCI, yeah. and then um, after I got in trouble, I went to uh, they shipped me to uh, Florence, and that's when I like got into uh, like a, a political yard uh, prison. Yeah, you know, it was a higher security, and there was probably more respect there than a Sunday at church. But when it got violent, that's when I learned that uh, man, this is really might not be how I want to live the rest of my life. You know, like being around race riots and, you know, just um, being young and naive yeah. kid from North Dakota. You don't, you no. don't know about a, a well, lot of gang life. Yeah, you're young. How old are you 
at this point? Um, I think I was about 20 by the time I went to Florence. So you're, you're 20 years old and you're watching all of this violence and you're watching all this craziness going on. You started to think to yourself, do you, do you really want this kind of life? Right. So, like, I remember, um, you know, I, I was always um, lucky enough to have um, good people around me. Yeah. And, um, you know, um, when I look back at it, they've always just kind of been, um, no matter what I've been doing, I've always had great people in my life, you know? Yeah. And um, when I got there, um, it was it was more of the same, you know, like, people kind of came up to me and like, Hey, how are you? You know, how is it going? This is kind of where you sit. Yep. This is, um, these are the rules because it's very racially segregated. Okay. Um, or it was at that time in um, the prison system. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, I kind of um, got with some um, guys that were, were um, involved in gang activity in there and kind of um, just kind of trying to, lift through it, you know? Yeah. And then when it came, um, time, I just remember, uh, like they used to, um, when it would riot, like I just never lived through anything so insane, you know, like you just got hundreds of guys just getting after it and people getting stabbed and it was just a scary time. Yeah. So like, um, they would, they would come down and they would, um, they would do a profile on you if, if you got caught up in the, any of that and like hog tie you up on uh, with zip ties and you'd just lay there for hours until they came around to you and cleaned up the whole yard. Yeah, I can't even imagine it. I can't even, I, I guarantee a TV and movies don't portray it as violent as you remember in your head. I'm sure, right? I'm sure there's right. image, images in your head you probably want to forget forever. Tell us how long you were in prison in a combined time. So how many times have you been in and out? Uh, so I've been to prison twice. Okay. And I, um, so that time I, I did five years okay. and then, uh, I got out, um, I got out and, um, the last, I just re- remember like one of them, right. One of them, um, there was some crazy stuff that happened right before I got out and I was, um, I didn't have any kids at the time, and I was just, like, thinking to myself, like, man, this is not a life I, I ever want to come back to, you know? Of course. And, um, and, and then it kind of kept me, you know, out of, when I got out, I was out of the, the, the drug scene. I didn't even want to touch it anymore. Yeah. And, um, but I still drank alcohol. So um, that kind of landed me. I was out on probation. Um, I started, my dad got me into trucking, um, hauling equipment yep. and, um, and kind of did that for a while. And then, uh, you know, got a DUI down in Sturgis and that's where my, um, alcohol, and, um, addictions got me in trouble again, you know, yep. and this time I'm on state and federal probation Okay, and it, it, co- it cost me to lose my, uh, CDL. Yeah. So I, I, there again, it cost me to, um, you know, fall backwards in life, you know, um, so it kind of went on, like, uh, I found different jobs and, um, ended up, uh, getting my CDL back. And while I was, um, I ended up getting married, uh, I think in like 2008, I had a little baby girl and, um, I'm not doing any, any of the drugs, but I'm still, still drinking and um, I have a, had my daughter Zoe, and uh, couldn't get along with um, her mother, so uh, we got a divorce after like six months. Did you ever think uh, so, w- when you uh, had the divorce? Did you ever think back to your parents when they separated? Um, what that was, you know, you know? I really didn't. Um, it wasn't. Uh, it just wasn't a, um, my parents divorce didn't really, um, uh, I never thought about how the broken, uh, um, this is all pro- product of broken home, right? Right. So I never really looked back at that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, I guess I wasn't mentally, I wasn't um, there yet. 
No, I understand. When you separated with your with your wife, though, you had a young, young, young girl, didn't you? How old was she? Um, so she, she was still a baby. Yeah, um, baby. You know, so um, yeah, it was it was a bad deal. Um, and then uh, my best friend uh, hung himself. Um, and uh, he right after he got off the phone with me. Wait, and wait, wait, where, wait, wait! Say that again. Your best friend, what? Uh, so when I had my daughter, my best friend was struggling, and um, he he kind of called me and he just um, asked me like, "Hey, if I asked you for something, would you, would you give it to me?" Yeah, and I said absolutely. And uh, he was supposed to meet me. I knew he was struggling, and you know, he, I said, "Meet me tomorrow for lunch," and he said, "Of course, I'll be there." And I said, "He promised." I said, "He said, yeah." And um, you know, kind of, you know, the part of addiction is a hole in your soul, obsession of your in your mind, and a disease of the body. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. And um, I don't really, I don't really s- split up the drugs and the alcohol because it's all to me the same thing. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a drug addict. I'm a gam- be a gambling addict. You know what I mean? So, um, it took me a long time to figure that out. But at at that point, when he killed himself, we we're going through our divorce, it all kind of happened at the, around the same time, and I just, uh, I just gave up on life, you know? He took himself, I, um, he took himself, he took his life after he talked to you on the phone, roughly, right? Right after, yeah. You, you don't harbor any, uh, you, you don't get down on yourself to this day that you feel that it, uh, you could have done anything, do you? Um, in the past, if that was, um, let's see here. 15 years ago, yeah. yeah, there isn't a day that goes by that I don't think I should have did something different. Do you ever talk to anybody about what you just told me? Because that's pretty heavy. That's very um, heavy. That's heavy. Well, I've talk, I, that's part of my story. And, um, you know, um, that's part of and actually how I live my life now is by helping others. And, um, you know, I just, that, um, so that I carried with me from 2000. Um, let's see here. Oh man. I've carried that. Well, for 15 years. Yeah. I carried that. i carried that with me. And, um, uh, it was after that, like, um, when I got sober this last time I was struggling. Yeah. And, um, that's kind of when it all came to a head. Um, so I, uh, I went back in and, and got into selling, uh, this time I started digging in and selling meth. Yeah. I'm selling large quantities of meth and um, just not, um, just kind of gave up on life, running around with, um, and doing just kind of running a criminal activity, you know what yeah. I mean? And, yeah. um, and just gave up on life, kind of um, at um, just getting in trouble with the law, having them raid my house, um, follow me around. And it was, um, I wasn't some sy- um, meth psychosis paranoia. It was, really what was going on and um uh say and so in 2014 uh i had my son uh family right uh, and um he's uh with the um with all that was going on i wasn't ready to be a, a not in a, any way shape or form um ready to have a, a, a child, another child. I was um, coming in and out of my daughter's life, and um, I have my son with the same person. So um, it just kind of became a thing of one day, um, 2000, after Christmas in 2015, I came up with this idea, like, hey, I'm going to leave town. I was already, um, already kind of burnt up in town, like, just um, not working, selling drugs, gambling, and um, at this point, I just told my. Uh, actually, it was one of the worst days of my life. Is uh, I told my daughter that, hey, um, dad's gonna go away, and it might be a real long time till you see him again. So um, how that kind of went was, I um, in March. Uh, 2015, I uh, left town. 
and um, I got pulled over by the BIA uh, so about 15 miles, near right on the north side of Fort Yates. I'd say halfway between the casino and the Prairie Nights and Fort Yates. Yeah. I got, I got, I got pulled over, and uh, I had a misdemeanor warrant, and I had um, somebody else's ID, driver's yeah. license. Yeah. And we passed for each other, and I had um, my motorcycle in the back of the pickup, and they, somebody called me in for suspicious activity. Yeah. And um, this is where my life changed. This is where the rubber met the road. Um, I go in, uh, get pulled over, and the, it went bad. And I ended up going, um, dragging the cop. Uh, we had gotten into a scuffle. Um, I jumped back in the pickup, and he started hitting me. And then uh, kind of I just took off, and he ended up getting dragged down the road for a little ways. Oh. And uh, kind of a miracle that he's alive, that he lived through it, yeah. you know, because that would have been bad. Yeah. But um, that's where... You know, I just needed that moment of, I was, um, I was just not in a good spot in life. I was selling drugs and doing drugs and just running down a dead end road. So, uh, that happened. I went, I went on a high speed chase for a couple, little bit, a couple hours and had some spike strips and it gave, uh, gave me a second chance at life, you know, um, went to, uh, jail fought the case and ended up getting five years for assault on a federal officer. And then I went to uh, Ox- Oxford, Wisconsin in the federal prison system. And um, that's where like uh, I started getting into um, making wine and moonshine and just got in um just to pass the time, I was just really in a bad way because uh, the, f- the the feeling of failing my kids and not being in that life um, just kind of killed me. My So that's kind of how that all went. Um, I didn't sober up in jail, prison. I actually became more of a alcoholic, you know. Anybody come and visit you while you were doing all that time? Um, so... Um, being that far away, my uh, mom and my kids came once. Yeah. And um, just when it came time to leave, I'll never forget um, my daughter. Uh, my son was awful young, and um, he's like, he was awful little. Yeah. But my daughter um, cried so hard, and she just has always said, Dad, I don't want you to leave. And, um, I just told my parents after that, like, uh, I told my mom after that, don't, don't bring them back here. You know, that, um, just to see my kids like that is, um, was hard, you know, that's gotta happen all the time. That's gotta happen with others yeah. that you talk to in jail in prison. That's gotta be, the, oh, yeah. that's gotta be one of the most gut wrenching feelings in the world. Oh yeah. When I came, I came out of that visit, like, you know, it didn't matter what, what, what race they were. They, get, you know, it's all right, Billy, and give me, give you a hug, you know, and yeah. and it's, uh, but it is definitely uh, one of the hard, hard things for me to talk about is um, uh, how much pain I've caused my kids. You know, um, yeah. Like I said, I got two great kids, so I got out of prison, and um, I, uh, I. Mean, uh, 2019, and I um, had a job waiting for me out in New Salem. I moved out there and um, started in, and I was doing good for like six months. Yeah. Um, I was on house arrest, and um, here I go. I started drinking again. Do you remember? And, you um, remember how you started? Do you remember something telling you, "Hey, you know what? Uh, I miss it." Did you miss it? Did you just want to? feel good again i mean just living out there and um being bored and yeah not much going on i just walked over to the bar yeah started drinking yeah and then um you know getting back to it um 
I end up getting doing drugs again and uh I'm not selling but um so I have I'm on federal probation. Yeah. And um I have you know, to this day I text my probation officer. Yeah. Um Lee and I'm just telling him how great of a person he is because um I had a uh ended up um going to a trucking company and doing heavy haul. Um uh, and my boss was Brad um had has been in that he actually bought that business um from my dad and um uh Brad gave me an opportunity uh to do this and he actually has like I don't know forty some maybe I don't want to age the guy too much, but he's got a lot of time in, in sobriety in the program. Right. So, um, my probation officer uh, lets me ride on it, ride on it, ride on it. One day he's like, I don't know what to do with you. And I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, I'm not going to throw you back in prison. And he's like, but, uh, is this really how you want to live the rest of your life? Yeah. And I said, um, no, it's not. Yeah. And he said, okay. Um, he ended up putting me back in center in the halfway house here. Mm-hmm. And uh, I got kicked out a week later because I got COVID. Uh, so oh, yeah. Now, yeah. got COVID, yep. Um, so this is where, you know, um, the rubber met the road. Again, like, uh, I, I, I don't have, I'm bored. I don't know how I'm going to stay sober. I'm going to meetings. I don't want to go to meetings. Yeah. I don't think I want to be, you know, I, I'm just at the point where I have to um, stay sober for a year to get off probation. Because you're constantly then, being uh, tested, right? Yeah, yeah. And then uh, I just don't know how I, how it looks or how I can do it, you know, because uh, yeah. I just, and what happens is I go to my friend's house, and this just so happens to be close to um, my buddy's uh, reunion date of him, um, taking his life, kill, kill it. Yep. And then his twin sister, I go there and she's like, you know, I'm so sick of this. Yeah. And this is what made it really made me take a look at myself. And I said, what are you sick of? And she's like, there's conversations I need to have with you that I can't. And I'm like, okay, why can't you? And she said, because, um, you and my brother and we're like all close friends. And she said, I can't even talk to the person that we love. Um, uh, between us the most without you absolutely breaking down. And I was like, hmm. So um, I was like, well, all right. Um, you know, and I was like, you know, she's like, it's not your fault. And um, I was like, well, I could have I could have done something different, you know. Uh, he'd asked me a, a question, and I told him I'd give him anything, you know. And he took it as I give him permission to do it, you know, and yeah. um, and that just um, kind of wore. And she's like, um, "I'm sick of it. You have to figure it out, man, because uh, I can't even talk to you about him." And I was like, "All right." Uh, so I went home that night because, and I know him too. And she told me like he would never want you to live like this. Yeah. And um, I went home and I wrote down a letter, mm-hmm. just to be like, "Hey, man." Uh, I know you wouldn't want me to feel like this. I said, if there's um, anything um, I can do for you, uh, let me know. And something came on TV. I had some music playing on TV, and a commercial came on about suicide prevention. You know, so I was sitting. Uh, I went to an AA meeting, and um, I'm sitting in AA, and um, I was talking about, like, hey, this is, was kind of a weird synchronicity or whatever and um somebody was sitting in there said hey would you come speak at a meeting so i went and spoke at one of these meetings a suicide prevention meeting and um after i spoke um somebody came up to me and said hey um you know just by you telling me what it's like for the people around you or around around us you know how it affects their lives um i just want you to know you you saved my life today Wow, and uh, at that point, I, I didn't wasn't working a real spiritual program. Right. Um, my um, 
uh, my alcoholism, drug addiction, um, actually, I was about the most insane um, sober person you ever met. Like, um, I was more angry than I'd ever been in my life. And, um, and I just, um, my controlling behaviors came back up, right? So, um, just, um, waiting for that, uh, moment, you know, like where something, cause you see p- happy people in the program, but why can't I be happy? You know, the, um, urges went away or the, um, you know, the urges for the drink or the drug went away, the cravings, but the um, happiness and the um, the calmness was not there. I was uh, more controlling and more fearful than I had ever been in my life. Yeah. So long story short, I had an individual in my life that I was not getting along with. I worked for him, and um, one day... Um, I will always appreciate this man um, because he is a, um, he is a man that just uh, there was a problem and that problem gave me a second a glimmering second of hope that that something outside of myself could re- re- relieve the insanity and um, take away the anger so I just right then and there um, I hit my knees. And uh, when I hit my knees, I said, God, if you're real, I need you to take this from me because I can't handle it, dude. I cannot do this on my own anymore. And um, whatever you look like, I need this gone. And it was like, this is probably like three months into my sobriety. Yeah. Um, my sponsor did a good job working the steps with me. And that's a different, that's another thing I did, you know, uh, before I'd kind of look at the people in AA and be like, uh, scoff at them, you know, like you guys are less than, or you guys aren't capable, or however that looks, right? But this time, I had to stay sober, so I I was gonna do everything right. I was gonna I was gonna get a sponsor, and I did, and I was gonna go through the book, and look, I did. Look at you and just did. Do- you just did step one. You did step two. Of course, you came to believe that a power greater than yourself, you knew that could restore us to sanity. You had already made a decision to turn your will and your lives over to the care of God as we understood them, as you understood them. How about that? How'd that make you feel? How strong did that make you feel? And uh, that's a pretty incredible thing, isn't it? That's just not by design, you know. That's that's a God thing. That's that's our oh, higher yeah. power thing by far. Well, as um, I'm a very extreme person in life, so... Right. Um, it was it was kind of funny because um, it all had to happen, and it, to put it all in a linear uh, time was kind of hard to do because it all happened at once. And I was actually on my step three. Yeah. When this all happened. Sure. So it was um, it was it was all by um, my higher power's design, right? Yeah. It was all by God's design. So um, going into it. Uh, I was one of my buddies was like, "Hey, I want you to be the godfather of my to my son," and uh, I said, "All right." And he said, "But I need I want you to go to church with us," and I was like, "Yeah, no." <laughs> yeah. Right. And he's like, uh, "He's like, uh, it became a big argument. Long yeah. story short, yeah. um, it ended up with me just leaving, but uh, saying I'll go to church for this purpose. So I went to church." And, uh, you know, from growing up uh, in a Catholic school and stuff, I just had so many, uh, like, reservations in my mind. And um, what happened was I went to church, and I got this tingling in my head. Right. And I told my buddy, I was like, man, I'm I'm not feeling good. I got this tingling. And he's like, oh, that's the Holy Spirit. And I'm like, yeah, that's enough for me. Uh, Kind of, like, I got up, and, uh, you know, even though, like, this anger got removed, I still, like, um, think I did it on my own, and my pride and ego showing up, and I was like, hey, man, uh, I'm good. So I went back to church the next week just to make sure that that's what, what it wasn't, you know what I mean? To make sure it wasn't the Holy Spirit. Right. God, you know, and I go, I go back to church, and sure enough, I get, a, I get it uh, stronger than the last time. So then um, that same friend... 
I had to go admit this to him that I was wrong, you know, that there is a power greater than me. Yeah. And um, by doing that, he's like, hey, do you want to go to this program called Shop Talk? And I was like, I was like, what is it? And um, he's like, oh, it's just a, a group of guys that get together. Um, and uh, I was like, all right, sounds good. And I go down there, and um, that's where my life really took a turn. What 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 do you guys talk about? Tell everybody because we're not sure. It's called oh, shop okay. talk. So, shop talk. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it's shop talk, and it's down at some guy uh, this Steve Skipple shop, and um, he it's uh I don't know what it is. I just I walk in there and uh it's a like a Bible study type deal. Okay. And uh, that's why he didn't tell me what it was because he knew I wouldn't go. Right. Um, but I I went there and um. Uh, what you do is you, um, you know, it doesn't matter, uh, what denomination you are. Right. Um, there's all sorts of different kinds of people that go there, um, alcoholics, uh, business owners, just a different walks away for show up there. Yeah. And you just, um, you watch, uh, a clip on TV mm-hmm. and then, um, afterwards, uh, everybody just kind of goes around and talks about it, you know? And, um. You know, when I went there, I had somebody just come up to me and put their hands on me and just say, hey, you have something big coming up in your life? And um, it got to kind of follow through with it. So leaving there, uh, my buddy's like, do you know what just happened to you? I was like, yeah, I'm sure they do that to every person there for the first time. And he's like, no, no, I've never seen it the whole time I've been here. So um, I kind of have... Um, you know, uh, my old boss, Brad, uh, Meyer and Clayton, uh, Meyer, are, um, their offices are in the same building. Well, Clayton was an arresting officer before, and I'd be, um, you know, I'd be, uh, under the influence when I'd go talk to Brad, and, um, I would just kind of stay away from Clayton because I knew, I knew he was the next cop, you know? So, um, one day Clayton calls me in his office and I go, and at this time I'm sober though. And, um, this is after I go to shop talk and, um, I start going there on a regular basis and, uh, Clayton's like talking to me and he has, I think, oh boy, I'm um, probably, he's got around like 38 years, I would say in the program. So, um, he's, uh, one of my main mentors in life. And, um, and that's kind of what got me going on. Um, you know, uh, when God took that anger from me and removed that, you know, me living in a a straight fearful state. Um, I was just like, I kept on asking, what do you want to do? What do you want me to do for you? So one of my old probation officers, I bump into him, uh, Mark Kemet. And he's like, hey, what are you doing for kids? And I'm like, man, um, nothing. I used to go speak at YCC. Yeah. But it's like as soon as I speak there, it's out of sight, out of mind, you know? Right. And I'm like um, kind of uh, pretty extreme. So, like, if I'm just going to go talk about it, I need to be about it, right? Right. So I'm just kind of um, going through the motions. And, I, um, and I, I'm pretty new with this higher power thing. But, like, people are just keep on bombarding me, kind of. Like, just with, like, hey, I just keep on having kids, 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 do something for these kids. You know, like, wouldn't it be great if we could stop addiction before it started? You know? So I kind of have that on my mind. And one day it just comes to me, like, hey, we have, um, we have these programs like AA, NA, GA, all sorts of them, right? Yeah. And it's like, wouldn't it be great um, if I set up, if, you know, I didn't do it, but God just put it on my heart. Like, Hey, let's set up a mentoring program for these kids. What age group are you talking so, about? All of it. Okay. All kids. Age. I mean, I, thought, I, I don't know. I don't do the diaper thing. So, yeah. um, so how it was kind of, um, put on me is like, Hey, let's, um, let's start this. When did I start? When did I really go? And, um, I came up and I'm like, I'm going to get 
came up with this idea one morning, and I'm like, I'm going to get maybe four go-karts. Yeah. And I'm going to um, go out to uh, YCC and tell me, tell them, hey, give me four of your worst-case scenarios. Yeah. The kids that you can't can't reach. And uh, it just kind of, I went back and I ran and told Clayton, one of the arresting officers, I was like, hey, man, I'm, this is what I'm going to do. And he starts laughing at me. And I was like, is it a bad idea? And he's like, I think it's an amazing idea. Can I be part of it? Yeah. So he's, he's, um, he's involved. Um, and then um, Mark Kemet, the old probation officer, uh, he uh, currently works in the, he's still in the correction system or corrections field. Yeah. Um, he, he tells me, he's like, I tell him, I was like, hey, do you want to be involved in this? You kind of help plant the seed. And he's like, yeah, let me, let me see about it. And, um, you know, and he comes back around, and he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm in. So, um, and then, um, I meet this gal, Andra, and she's like, um, we talk about it and she's like, I'm in too. So that was, um, the, and then, um, later on we, we run into Dan Jones and he gets involved in it and, um. He's he doesn't have any um, addiction in his life, so he's not really sure how this works. I just tell him, "Hey man, just jump on. I'm just um, ride 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 it out and see what you think." So the uh, um, well, how it turns out is one day um, I go walk into Clayton's office. I'm like, Clayton, I think we're gonna need something. People keep on talking about a 501c3. Yeah. So he slides over this Frank Hunkler's number, and um. That guy has uh, just um, kind of done a lot of them, and uh, he he actually um, told us what he needed, and we just got it going for him. And um, I think mean, next thing you know, um, he was kind of telling us, "Hey, this might take a couple years," and I was like, "Yeah, it's not going to take that long, though." And um, I think it was all done pretty much within a year. So the five hundred C was written. Uh, the 501c3 was written, and um, it was such a learning experience, you know, coming up with the curriculum, and then that's when we came up with, like, okay, well, the outline of how it works, you know, having different stages of it, you know what I mean? Right, and this is called what? Tell everybody what this is called again. Oh, Destination Elevation. Destination. El- elevation. Elevation, Destination Elevation. Yeah. And underline that, and what is the main purpose of this, for to help out kids, to keep them from becoming involved with addiction? Right. So it's just um, kind of, uh, it's being proactive instead of reactive. Sure. Because um, as you can tell with my story, I've been through, um, a, you know, points of my life, sober addiction, sober going back out, sober going back out. Yeah. You know, just the back and forth. So I was like, um, "What can what can we do to change that?" And how does, it's like, "Hey, how what? amazing! How amazing do you think that this is? Uh, if you think about it, from where you came from, the rough early years you had. I mean, you started out young. You went to prison and all that, served time. Now look what you're doing. Don't you think it's pretty amazing that you're a role model for kids? Well, I think it's amazing." That I turn my life over to my and my will over to my higher power. Oh, absolutely! Was, and and, and, look, then, and look what you've done with it. It's all it's all him. It's not it's not me. It's um he's brought uh, everybody in my life to do it, and um and um and he works through uh all the people around around us, and it's all all you know uh, all the glory is to him, not me. I'm a when I, when I'm running the show. I end I end up uh, going down the wrong street. So um, well, just being to a point where I was willing to um, do whatever he puts in front of me, right? Well, check it out. What was your best friend's name that took his life? Ryan. I guarantee you Ryan is with you every time you do this. I guarantee you. Uh, I guarantee yeah, you he's think, on your shoulder. He's on your left shoulder. Yeah. I think there's a lot of people um, that... Um, you know, when uh, when we talk about that kind of thing that are guiding us together as a unit. And, um, and I, um, you know, I've had the opportunity to help some kids out. And, um, you know, uh, 
all, all, all um, I can say is, you know, if we can get to that kid at the first age of acting out, yep. um, acting out in school, the attention seeking, if, you know, or fighting, violence, truancy, uh, however that looks, and get with that kid because they're just missing something. Okay, can people you look? Know, can people look you guys up on Google? Destination Elevation. Can they look? Can they look up your program through there? Yeah, they can. Look, they can find us on. We have a website. And is is this something that they can, you know, after they get the information they need, can they just show up and they can introduce themselves to you? Right. Yeah. And then we have an application and um, process and a referral process. Okay. So um, you know, um, I had been working with a kid that um kind of went full circle in the program, and he was like, um, you know, I would like to, I I want to help other other people just like you. And I was like, well, right, this is how we do it. And I'm um, just kind of showing them the steps we take in life. And, you know, it's a lot easier. Um, I can't say it's a lot easier. Uh, I would say it's a lot more effective if we can get to them before that first drug and drink. Does. Of course, but sometimes it's not that easy. Um, does anybody ever say to you, why are you doing this, Ryan? Uh, I'm sorry, Bill. Bill, why are you doing this? Um. You know, what is uh, your answer? People, I want to know your answer to that. I'm sure you're. I'm sure you look at him with a smile and you say, I, "If you can only see my heart right now through my skin." Um, what I what I tell him is, um, I was a weak man in um, my addiction and, and committing crimes, or violence, or anything I did. I was totally weak, uh, but that's the one that um, you know the, the, uh, the good Lord above chose to uh, fulfill his mission because he knows that the weaker you are when you come to him, that's how that's you you have to fill that void with, with faith. So it takes all the, you got love and fear in your heart. It takes out the fear and and replaces it with faith. Yeah. Well, you know, he picked the perfect man because here's the thing. You've lived it. You've gone through pain. You lost your friend. You've seen violence. You've been through alcohol and drugs and, police activity and on the run basically and you know you got to think sometimes if when you're by yourself and it sounds to me like you probably say to yourself why me but but I but I love the fact that you're getting but I'm, I'm sure now that you've been doing this for how long have you been doing this now so um we've been at um you know with the whole getting the um 501c3 we've been going at it for about two years that's amazing so 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 what what i'm trying to tell you is i'm sure when you think to yourself because you had said minutes ago that sometimes um at first you're probably thinking you know i'm not worthy or why me well our higher power knows why you because because you're the right guy to lead younger kids into a better life because, man, I tell you, as you know, Bill, the first years of doing stuff and bad stuff and it can lead into more and more and more, it just snowballs and tumbles, and that's the life that we ran. We ran. When, you're, when, you're, uh, when you're doing this program and you're teaching them the right things and feeling good about yourselves, what a great thing that is to rest your head on your pillow and think about. I mean, do you ever give yourself a pat on the back and think about how awesome that is what you're doing? Well, um, I would say I give, um, you know, like my mentors the pat on the back, you know, like Frank, Clayton, the whole list of them that goes Dale. Karen. Sure, sure. Um, I got a whole, I probably have like 10 people around me guiding me, you know, like, yeah. hey, you know, helping me stay because um, sometimes it's not the easiest thing, you know, um, you know, we get, you know, um, sometimes there's, there's the kids that we can't, can't save or help, you know, and that's, them are the tough times. So, oh, I'll bet. um, I'll I, bet. I just, I see it like this, like our purpose is to walk each other home. Right. Right. Our calling, our specific calling is to use any pain or hardships that we've lived through in our life. Right. To make sure that other people don't have to live that same way. Well, you wonder though, the kids you can't reach at this moment, you hope that the, that one day those kids will turn around and reach the direction you want them to. And you know, that's possible, don't you? Because that's how your life kind of went. 
it was rough for would, a while? I would say to anybody, you know, like if if um if you're at the point of giving up, that's that's and just surrendering to something better than outside of yourself. Yeah, is, um, that's where it's at. Like it's that's, um the struggle that's is it. real. I've I've been there. I've eleven different treatments or treatment programs. That's some it. Some of them intensive. Yep. And um, it's like when um. Don't ever think there's not hope. No. Well, but I would just ask that before you know you got people that are homicidal or suicidal. Yeah. Before you reach that point, if you could do one thing, is just hit your knees and ask your higher power to come 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 through in your heart. That could be the it could that is the game changer for me. I've been there, Bill. I've been there many times where I thought there was no hope. So I continue on that day-by-day-by-day drinking and feeling my blood pressure boil and wonder when it was the time that I was going to stroke out or whatever because I had no hope because I didn't think there was a way. There is no way out. Um, I think you have an incredible story. Let me ask you this. When you were, you were bringing me almost to tears when you were telling me one of the worst days in your life was, was your daughter crying uncontrollably. How, how is that today? Do you see her, your kids? Oh, uh, you know, good question. So um, that's part of the story I kind of skipped over. Um, so when I started doing um, where I sell my heart from God, um, and I call him God, I don't mean to offend anybody. No, uh, you're good. And, and, uh, and, doing, and just trying to live a life like Jesus did. Um, when um, I did that, that's, you know, like, there's a lot of hard stuff that came with it. Yeah. My daughter um, actually told me a few months before that um, I wasn't her dad, that she hated me. Sure. And um, she quit talking to me for two years. Okay. And then um, the next time I talked to her was um, she said um, she called me and she said, Dad, will you come get me? So, um, yeah, I've had custody of my daughter and my son um, now. Uh, for about a year and a half. So, yeah, I get to talk to her. <laughs> it's pretty cool um, being a, you know, a career criminal. And, um, you know, there's, a, there's so much that God will do. I, he gave me a great um, – he opened up a, so many opportunities with um, JNS Heavy Hall and, um, and then um, opened up another opportunity with Barnhart, Crane, and Rigging. Yeah. And, um, and then that just kind of – everything – has just, you know, even in the struggle, that's, you know, when the hard times come with um, relationships or whatever, that's where God is, is putting on the armor to go do this, his will, right. is how I see it. So I kind of got used to um, some of the hard things. You know, um, my kids are definitely um, such uh, great human beings. Um, being a single dad and, and working... Um, and, and working on this program, it takes a lot of time from them. Um, but, you know, there's um, no way I can tell you how great having um, a good family, even though it, it didn't work out. And it, the, I have two, I just, like I said, I've been blessed with the best two sisters. I am, I am my parents' favorite child. And I forget, I'm, I'm sorry to tell my sisters that, but no, I, they are cool. They, um, I joke with them about that all the time, but um, I had two great sisters, and my, my mom and my dad are both great people, you know, and um, just um, being blessed. And the thing I have to admit to myself is I was, uh, I was the one that um, created my own life, right? But within all that, there is um, a higher power that's just lining you up. And if you'll do that po- higher power's will, whatever um, hardships you've been through, he will use that to help other people through it. Because what I found out is um, I can, I can be, um, I can uh, live in myself, in my own mind. Yeah. And when I'm in my own mind, in my own head, uh, I, and this is all since I've um, turned my will and life over to God, I can still go down the wrong path, right? So when I, when I do that, I just have to um, go out and help somebody. And just realize that, you know what, this isn't all about me. This is about what I can do for you. And that's probably why you do this, um, this uh, podcast, I'm guessing. 
Well, you know, like I, I've said a million times, the strength is not me in this podcast, not even close. It's people like you, Bill, that come on. It's people like you that have um, stories where um, it's climbing out of the darkest days and rebuilding your confidence, rebuilding your life, restoring relationships. And that's a wonderful thing. And like you said, our higher power brings us to that. I like what you said. You said God putting on his armor. Is that what you said earlier? Uh, so, like, yeah. So when we when when I go out and uh, it's not all rainbows and sunshine. No, um, there not. there are um, bad things that come come up. And um, like I said, you know, like sometimes you're you're really trying to um, help somebody. Yeah. I think it might not seem to them like you're trying to help them. Right. You know, but um, that's where we ha- we have to live outside of ourselves. Right. You know, and I just, there are so many people out there willing to help, you know, like. There really uh, are. I there really to, are. Uh, Kurt, uh, Kurt Shafi, Shafi, Pastor Kurt at New Song, uh, was, took me under his wing, and, and that's where he told me, he said, God, God will give you uh, tools, and he'll give you weapons. Yeah. You know, because um, this is this this is um, not only is it a war on drugs. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a war on fear. Yeah. Well, listen. You know what I mean. Keep doing what you're doing, Bill. Keep being. Thank you, sir. Of course, what you're doing for younger kids is so crucial. I don't even uh, think that the majority of People when they when they when they when they get older really want to do anything to help kids out for anything more than just uh, you know being a good parent of this or that or taking a ball game or whatever spending time on the, what you're doing is you're right there in the grit and you're and you're showing these kids how life could be really bad or it could be really good and you're trying to avoid them from getting into the world of addiction you know how huge that is that's just gigantically huge. If that's a word, <laughs> gigantically huge. Again, tell everybody the program again. I want everybody to know so they can Google it. Tell everybody the program again. A destination Elevation. Yeah, please do me a favor, Bill, and let your two sisters and your family hear this and hear what a great guy you are. Will you do that for me when we're done and I send this to you? Will you let your parents hear it? Well, it's all my family. They just... They've never given up on me. No, I know, you know that. I know that. I just want I them to hear. I want them to hear what kind of what kind of story that that you've uh, gone from rough to uh, helping people. Not everybody can say that. Is that cool with you? That's cool with me, Bill. You're an awesome guy. I really appreciate you sharing with my audience what your story is all about. Thank you, guys, and thank you for your time. I know you that you shared a lot. How often do you think you speak? Uh, how often do I speak? Yeah. Um, at least, um, I try to do at least once a month at Heartview. Sometimes a couple times, two, three times, um, depending on when they, they need me to come in or ask me to come in. Um, and, uh, anytime that I can help somebody with my story, just, to, um, walk them home, man, get them on board and, you know, and that's what it's all about, you know? Well, I'll bet you I can fill this blank. The greatest feeling in the world is the blank is when someone comes up to me and says, I heard you speak about two or three years ago and you changed my life. Isn't that the greatest feeling, Bill? The greatest feeling is just doing whatever God puts on my heart. Yeah, you hang on, Bill. Awesome guy. You see, that's that's why I love this podcast so much. Different stories, different shares, different uh, ways of people becoming sober, changing their life of addiction. It truly is a, 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 a way of life, a miracle. I say it's a miracle for me every single day I wake up sober. And for you, for anybody who's suffering, for your neighbors or your or loved ones or yourself, thank you for listening to this podcast. I hope you share it with others because my name is Bromo. There is a way out. <laughs>